This is a day I've been looking forward to for two and a half years. Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. This is the first iPhone, released June 2007. At first glance, there's really not a whole lot to it. It's very clearly an iPhone, with the iconic Apple logo on the back, and on the front, the familiar iOS layout and home button. The design, the size, the display, everything here certainly feels antiquated, but the core experience is there regardless, just like on the top of the line iPhones today. While it might feel like everything has changed and been innovated upon massively since 2007, what's perhaps really surprising is just how much actually hasn't changed. While people may not be familiar with this model of iPhone in particular, if you were to hand it to any random passerby on the street, they'd instantly be able to tell you it's an iPhone. Today, we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. A widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone, and a breakthrough internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, and an internet communicator. An iPod. A phone. Are you getting it? These are not three separate devices. This is one device. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech, and it's been a while since we've taken a look at the first ever iPhone. Almost five years, as I posted on it back in uh, late 2019. Now, that's no short amount of time, but since then, not a whole lot has actually changed. Sure, I'm older, maybe uh, maybe a little wiser, maybe. Definitely more tired, but ultimately, pretty much the same as I was. And all that applies about doubly for the first ever iPhone. Back in 2019, this phone was already basically unusable in any real practical sense. This is still very much the case today, though the situation is even bleaker, with a 2G networking becoming only more and more rare in most parts of the world. Although even if you could connect this phone to cellular, there's no way you'd want to use it in any practical sense. It's old, slow, and incompatible with nearly any of the features and utilities that we take for granted today. Even so, as we review how this phone has stood the test of time, I think you'll find notable not so much what makes this phone obsolete, but instead the building blocks that have been maintained through the years as integral aspects of smartphone DNA continuing 17 years down the road and beyond. Beyond. At least on paper, this phone is still basically what any Android or iPhone wants to be. It's mobile, it has internet connectivity and Bluetooth, a battery to power it, and a port to charge it, your buttons and power, volume, a mute switch, a multi-touch display for interacting with the software, a camera, a speaker, a microphone, a SIM card slot, heck, in a few ways this phone has even more than the modern experience, such as the old physical home button, and more tragically, the headphone jack may it rest in peace. Not many of those features are actually too relevant to what this phone was originally seen as which was a phone. All these things were more to do with the smart part of the smartphone, which would become an entirely new category of product, an essential tool in daily life purely thanks to this device right here. People in 2007 certainly knew this had the potential to be big, but even Steve Jobs himself had no way to predict the absolute runaway success and massive industry that would spawn from this, eventually leading Apple to be a $3 trillion company today. A world where people are walking around outside with these big Apple Vision Pros on, augmented reality headsets reminiscent of sci-fi fantasy that is only just now potentially becoming reality. We don't know yet if Vision Pro will truly take the world by storm. It could take a while without a budget model, but the iPhone, well, I mean, we all know what happened there. It was the first smartphone, or rather, the first modern smartphone. As well, internet-capable smartphones had indeed existed prior to iPhone, they were severely limited, overcomplicated, and unintuitive, at least compared to Apple's offering, with its single button on the front and multiple touch display. The iPhone was an incredibly unique piece of hardware that did so much in such a small package, but technically, it wasn't actually Apple's first foray into the cellular phone industry. As in 2005, Steve Jobs unveiled the Motorola Roker E1, also known as the iTunes phone. There's one more thing about iTunes that we're announcing today. You've probably heard about this. Uh, today, we are introducing the iTunes phone. If you haven't noticed, uh, Jobs doesn't exactly sound excited during this presentation. It's actually pretty funny because I cannot think of another time Jobs was this clearly unhappy to present something on stage. He was always such a great salesman, he was always so passionate, but here it sounds like he's doing this at gunpoint, which uh, he may have even preferred. One day I want to do a full video on this, but the long and short of it is that this was a complete disaster, as Motorola simply rebranded their year-old E398 and then threw iTunes on there 
there with the ability to sync only up to 100 songs, all at much slower transfer speeds than an iPod. It was also announced the same day as the iPod Nano, which the Motorola CEO would claim undercut the Roker E1 to the point of sabotage from Apple. Truthfully, they really should have just put out a much better cell phone to go in conjunction with a feature that should have ensured a home run product, but that's not what happened. The experience clearly taught Jobs a solid lesson when it came to the mobile phone market, and how it seemed to be in a state of complicity. So if you want to do a job right, you need to do it yourself, and that's exactly what the iPhone would be only a couple short years later. Except this time, it wouldn't just combine two major pillars of technology in both an iPod and phone, but it would add a third in being an internet communicator, and one far more capable than anything that had ever been conceived to this point. And as if that wasn't enough, all in a package thinner, sleeker, and exceedingly better designed than anything and everything surrounding it. Steve Jobs and Apple, unlike Motorola, were never going to settle for the status quo, and the world has never been the same because of it. We got the first look today at what Apple says is the next big thing. The iPhone from Apple, it is highly anticipated. There are two kinds of cell phones out there, the kinds that simply make and receive calls, and then the smartphones that do everything else. And here it is. No. Actually, here it is, but we're gonna leave it there for now. We're gonna take our time with this, but can you use this phone? Let's get that out of the way. The first stumbling block is 2G networking, which is extremely scarce when it comes to carriers who still support it, so actually using this phone as a phone probably isn't feasible, and we'll discuss that a bit more later on. But beyond just that, you also really can't use this iPhone as much of an iPhone in the first place. While web browsing with Safari actually does work and you can connect to Wi-Fi just fine, I was completely unable to log in with my Apple ID, only getting this error. There's a number of apps that just don't do anything now, as they incorporate various web services. The iTunes store doesn't work, the app store doesn't work, and I mean at all, they just won't load. The weather app doesn't work. Yahoo provided the forecast up to iOS 7, and their servers for this shut down back in 2019, making this app worthless. The Stocks app also isn't working, and this is despite the fact that Yahoo Finance actually does still provide Apple stock info all these years later. Of course, this software here isn't what the iPhone originally came with, and the app store actually didn't even hit iPhone until 2008. It's very possible to downgrade these devices. Either way, the App Store doesn't work, which means we cannot download apps, unless we do some jailbreaking and sideloading magic, but it does leave the iPhone in basically a unusable state, although there's no reason you'd want to use it, as we will get into. First, let's back up and actually look at what I hold in my hands here. The iPhone 2G might look and even feel like an iPhone, but the design and hardware is still a far cry from what we've got 17 years later. Next to the modern Titanium 15 Pro Max, it feels tiny, and yet it's quite thick and heavy, with a rounded back making it comfortable to hold, and the small size making it easy to use with one hand, which was a very intentional choice early on. The iPhone uses a silver aluminum for the shell with a black plastic strip on the bottom, giving it this very unique two-tone look that Apple has actually never brought back in the years following. And then you've got the standard stainless steel frame holding the entire thing together. The black plastic covers the antennas, something that with advancements in tech has gotten a lot more subtle over the years. At this point, they're just these little tiny strips in the frame, which Apple's been actually doing since the 2010 iPhone 4, believe it or not. The aluminum here was actually quite the premium material at the time, as cell phones, smart or not, were generally all plastic front to back, and if they did have much of a display, that would be even smaller, and significantly so. Watching old reviews and TV reports from when this phone was announced, you hear so much about its huge high resolution screen, which feels almost amusing in hindsight. It's pretty clear just how low resolution this phone is standing next to Apple's current offerings, but it would only take to the iPhone 4 before smartphone displays were starting to look really good, or at least good enough that you couldn't generally see the pixels with your bare eye and everything appeared sharp. We'll talk more about the screen and the actual technical specs a bit later, and while they were incredibly impressive in 2007, they haven't exactly aged the best, which is exactly what you would expect given how computer technology as a whole, particularly in the mobile sector, has improved exponentially year over year. The basic framework though, the foundation, is absolutely still here with the iPhone 2G, and every single smartphone that decided to forego with a physical keyboard since this device came out has based its entire identity off of this original design, whether iPhone, Android, Windows Phone, or anything else. It was inevitable because this phone managed to completely revolutionize what a phone even is in the first place. In 2007, a phone made calls. In the 2020, 
companies, that's near the bottom of priorities for the majority of users. The aluminum build might have been ahead of its time, but it also wasn't particularly durable compared to newer models. The metal scratches, dents, and marks up very easily, making these phones really hard to find in good condition, all amplified by the fact that cases for phones were nowhere even remotely near as magnanimous as they are today. The displays also typically have a number of issues. They scratch and crack pretty easily, and they also get dead pixels like this. So while my two first gen iPhones are neither in particularly great condition, they're actually not too bad all things considered. They kind of look dirty on the back, but they're not. This is just how these phones look at this point. As for the cracks on the front, theoretically I could definitely replace the digitizer glass on these without too much trouble, as these early iPhones are relatively easy to repair, but it feels a bit wrong for me to tinker or modify such an important piece of tech history. Also, I'm lazy. That's the real reason. Actually, I do have a third uh, original iPhone. It just doesn't work, so I forgot about it completely. I believe it freezes up at boot. One of these days, I'll try to get it fixed. This big display, though, was such a big deal, and not just for the touchscreen, although, I mean, that was basically magic in 2007. Get that picture within picture up. I'm going to go ahead and just push the sleep-wake button. And there we go, right there. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide it across. All right, you want to see that again? Go to sleep. We wanted something that you couldn't do by accident in your pocket and just slide it across. Boom. Specifically, we're looking at a full 3.5 inches with a resolution of 320 by 480, making for a pixel density of 163 pixels per inch. The screen alone, even isolated from the multi-touch functionality, was incredibly revolutionary for the time. It provided users with an unprecedented level of clarity and detail on a purely mobile device, and far outpaced most contemporaries. Yes, all this from a 320 by 480 screen that has a ratio of 3 by 2. Not even the modern 16 by 9 widescreen that would eventually come with the 2012 iPhone 5. Well, how do I scroll through my list of artists? How do I do this? I just take my finger and I scroll. When it comes to resolutions, what's important is not necessarily the raw numbers themselves, but mainly the pixel density. The higher the pixel density, the sharper and cleaner an image. That's why when the iPhone XR came out back in 2018 and people started ragging on it for being barely above 720p and thus, you know, depressing or whatever, well, you could tell anyone saying this hadn't actually used the phone, because it still had the pixel density of 326 pixels per inch. The screen was nothing special, but it wasn't bad either. It was fine. That number is the same magic number that Apple had been using since they first really upgraded that original iPhone display, specifically with the iPhone 4 in 2010. They went from 320 by 480 to 640 by 960. Now that already sounds a lot better, being double the original resolution, but it also doubled the pixel density. And because of this, the Retina display completely transformed how we view and even use these machines. One of the worst aged aspects of the iPhone 2G is in fact the screen, for, well, a multitude of reasons. We mentioned dead pixels and lack of durability, but in an ideal situation that won't be relevant, what stands out is more the fact that you can see the pixels. It looks pixelated, everything feels blurry. There's physical deficiencies too, such as a noticeable gap between the top display digitizer glass, being the glass you actually touch with your finger, and then the LCD itself, which is the thing displaying an image. There's more lacking here, I mean it was top of the line in 2007, but that was 17 years ago. There's a pretty gnarly blue tint to the LCD if you look at it even slightly off angle. The touch functionality isn't quite as consistent as later models. It's okay, but not amazing. The screen doesn't get very bright. There's more to it, but you know, what's really mind-boggling to me is that legitimately all of these shortcomings were in fact fixed with the 2010 iPhone 4, its laminated retina display, and standard of 326 pixels per inch. These days, Samsung is typically regarded as the kings of screen tech, and Apple would succumb to this fact eventually, with the iPhone 10 bringing in a Samsung-made but Apple-designed OLED panel, making for basically the ultimate display back in 2017. Now at this point, screens are so good that there's not really been any notable innovations here. Even since the last time I took a look at the iPhone 2G, changes nowadays typically surround higher refresh rates, smaller bezels and notches, and not a whole lot more, unless you count foldable smartphones, which is something Apple's tried to avoid thus far. Basically, what I'm getting at is since the iPhone 4, any iPhone display has actually aged extremely well in quality despite the size and form factor. The first iPhone, or the second or the third, not so much. But you know, it's revolutionary and innovative and yada yada yada, you get the point. It's from 2007, what could you possibly expect? It was the best back then. Why do we need a revolutionary user interface? I mean, here's four smartphones, right? The problem with them is really sort of in the bottom 40 there. 
It's, it's this stuff right here. They all have these keyboards that are there whether you need them or not to be there. Well, every application wants a slightly different user interface, a slightly optimized set of buttons just for it. Functionality-wise, this screen is fine, just small. It absolutely does the job and for a new product that was aimed to not only compete with, but entirely replace any other smartphone that had existed to this point. Yeah, this was pretty insane. And Apple really only needed the touch screen to get people on board. Heck, a very good chunk of people in 2007 no doubt still used cell phones with just tiny monochrome displays as well as painfully tiny plastic buttons. And you can only imagine just how earth shattering this first iPhone truly must have been. A touch screen was some serious sci-fi magic and it was also intuitive thanks to the software as well as the hardware. But what we're gonna do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. A giant screen. Now, how are we gonna communicate this? We don't wanna carry around a mouse, right? So what are we gonna do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're gonna use a stylus. No. <laughs> no. Who wants a stylus? You have to get them and put them away and you lose them, yuck. Nobody wants a stylus. So let's not use a stylus. Touchscreens existed, but they kind of sucked. Think like the Nintendo DS. Yeah, you could use your finger with it. But the stylus was much more precise and basically a necessity. Thanks to iPhone, this is no longer the case today. Just yet another bold, but ultimately correct, step made by Apple's engineers. They could have had a stylus for this thing and nobody would have even blinked an eye. But in typical Steve Jobs fashion, oh no, if we're doing this, we're doing it right the first time. And in doing so, they set the precedent for how a smartphone was even defined. They became no longer purely just internet capable cell phones, but now, a smartphone was a cell phone with a touch screen. Sorry, Blackberry. I'm sure your future is bright, though. Don't worry about it. While the display quality itself has not aged great, the bigger difference most will probably notice now is the size, which is obviously small. Compared to the 15 Pro Max, 3.5 inches versus 6.7, yeah, there is no comparison, really. Not only are there thick bezels in the home button on the smaller iPhone, but just how tiny this thing feels in general is wild. But, of course, it is still very easily recognizable as an iPhone, and from that perspective, the 15 Pro's oldest sibling has actually stood the test of time pretty easily. Still though, one initial tenant of smartphones that has long since been overwritten is the idea that the device should only be usable with one hand, and so small enough to suit this need. If you look at old reviews of the first iPhone, it's actually kind of comical just how many say that this phone had a very large high resolution screen, because in 2007 that's exactly what it was. At best, you would have maybe half of this screen size with some crappy plastic keyboard crammed under it on contemporary smartphone models. Speaking of which, this is the iPhone 11 Pro Max. Look at that size difference. <laughs> Man, phones have gotten so much bigger nowadays, and it doesn't even feel like they're that big, but they really are. Making a smartphone design that is easily usable with one hand for basically anybody? Actually not too easy, considering, you know, everyone has differently sized hands. So if I had to guess, this was as big as they could make this phone without scaring people away. It made more sense for early iPhones to be smaller. That was the norm, and if anything, most cell phones had only been getting smaller over the past decade. There's this old episode of a hilarious Canadian TV show called Corner Gas, where a couple characters basically have like an arms race to try to own the smallest cell phone. It ends with them getting made fun of and realizing just how ridiculous the whole scenario was. And then of course they end up with big phones at the end. When smartphones began to more and more transform into platforms for primarily media consumption rather than, well, you know, being phones, this is when the bigger and bigger screens started to become more highly desirable, which gave Samsung the opening to finally alleviate some of Apple's dominance. They had something you simply could not get on an iPhone, and the rise of phablets was meteoric. Sadly, Steve Jobs passed before larger phones really began to get big, no pun intended. So it's difficult to say whether or not he would have reevaluated his previous one-handed use requirement or philosophy, but the iPhone 5 was a step in the right direction, and Apple did eventually give in to demand, and a lot of demand, with the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus remaining to date as the best-selling smartphones of all time. The home button under this screen was also for the longest time the most iconic design element element of any iPhone, at least right behind the Apple logo on the back. Like the iPod, the front of the phone made it instantly discernible at only a glimpse, and this would be a mainstay until 2017 with the iPhone X, and even past that we've still had iPhones be sold with the home buttons, as recent as the year of this video, 2024. The home button wasn't solely unique to iPhone when it first came out, as dedicated menu buttons and similar features had in fact existed on other phones, but to have it be the only button, I mean aside from like the power and volume buttons, now that was a big deal, and whether replaced with the gesture system or three button home bar or even a very similar 
physical home button with or without a fingerprint sensor built in, the home button on iPhone is inexorably one of its most brilliant design elements, perhaps only behind the display itself. This all being said, this home button kind of sucks. I mean, it's awesome, but the durability of these old buttons are pretty awful, and they tend to get stuck or squishy or sticky, that's probably the best word, just difficult to use in general so many years later. I've brought this up when looking at older iPhones before. This thing just doesn't work half the time. I mean, it typically does work, but you gotta really give the push some oomph to it. Mind you, again, this does vary device to device, but it is an overwhelmingly common problem with older home button iPhones in general, and also not unique to neither this model or iPhone as a whole. Other smartphones with physical buttons of any kind undoubtedly could have similar problems down the line. It's just the nature of having a physically clickable button. More moving parts means more breakable parts, and while not everyone was a fan of the iPhone 7's fake capacitive home button that only mimicked a click instead of actually clicking, I've always felt like it was a no-brainer, if only for the sake of permanent immutability. Long story short, home button was innovative and revolutionary like all the rest, but I'll be damned if it isn't a pain to try to use this thing these days. It's all amplified by some fun quirks in the software. If you hit the home button once, you of course go home. If you hit the home button a second time after getting to the home screen, but not too quickly, it'll bring you to the search. Yeah, there's a search here, and it's about as useful as the modern version, honestly. Take that whichever way you want. Now, if you hit the home button twice, you need to be quick about it, but not too quick, at least on my phones, because the home buttons don't work half the time, and so it keeps bringing me to that cursed search screen. But if you nail the timing, which was probably much easier to do 17 years ago, it doesn't open the multitasker like you might expect, because no multitasker exists. You might remember the old app switcher from iOS 4 to iOS 6, and then the far superior one that's practically the same today as it was in 2013, coming with iOS 7. That's what hitting the home button twice would do eventually, but in the early days, it actually just opened up your phone favorites, at least by default. I don't even know if I knew this until writing this review and messing with things, but it turns out you can actually customize this double click. That's right, Apple actually gave us the ability to customize an element of their software all the way back in 2007. Who knew? Under settings, general, and home, we've got a bunch of different options for our double home button click. There's home which makes it just bring you home. <laughs> so I guess it basically just ignores your double press. Honestly, probably useful for somebody who maybe struggled with this button, like myself, apparently. The other actual options entail search, phone favorites, camera, and iPod. The iPod application is what they called the Music app originally to give it some extra brand recognition for new customers. I can't help but sort of equate this to one of Apple's newest features on the iPhone 15 Pro with the action button that replaced the mute switch. The UI has been massively improved, albeit most iOS settings actually do still look almost identical to that original table view layout that came with the first iPhone. The UI for the action button just has to be special and quirky for some reason, but it allows for a bunch of different functions mapped to it, like say, opening the camera app. Just like on the first iPhone hitting the home button twice. This probably isn't a big deal, and action buttons or mapping things to a button has been done by so many different phones, but I honestly do find it so impressive that Apple had this sort of customizability so long ago, especially when contrasting with how they've generally gone about things the past decade and then some. If only that wretched home button actually worked with any level of consistency. Looking around the iPhone, we immediately find so many more of the core fundamental features of any smartphone released since. On the top of the phone is the power button, which lines up perfectly with the index finger when holding the phone in your right hand. A very intentional choice. Of course, later that power button would be moved to the side because phones got bigger. The SIM tray sits at the top, which is unique to early iPhones. This would get moved to the side of the phone with the iPhone 4. And this, by the way, is a full-size SIM tray, not micro SIM like with the iPhone 4, or nano SIM with like the iPhone 5 to today. But instead, this absolute unit. If you've ever gotten a SIM card that comes with those weird cutouts, yeah, that's why there's different sizes for different phones. On the opposite side of the power button is the headphone jack, which is one thing I don't think anybody expected to become obsolete only nine years after the first iPhone, but here we are. While having this headphone jack in general is awesome, it was very much just a standard for any portable device at the time, and yet Apple actually still screwed it up. The port is a bit inset, making it so only particularly shaped headphones can actually plug in, such as the pre-included Apple earbuds, and uh, probably some others, but if you had some earbuds or headphones already that you liked, it would be a toss-up whether or not you'd be able to use them with your iPhone. Funnily enough, I've got some Shore earbuds here that I was trying to plug in to show an example of the jack not fitting, but it turns out these are just the perfect shape to click right in there, no problem. So that's neat. But yeah, this was a commonly complained about thing back in the day, and thankfully Apple did fix this issue by getting rid of the inset altogether with the iPhone 3G in 2008. On the top left corner of the phone, we've got the mute switch and the volume rocker below it. On the right side of the phone, we've got nothing. And on the bottom of the phone, we've got a speaker, microphone, and 30-pin charging port. I've done a video explaining the different charging ports iPhones have used 
by the way, that video will be linked in the description. But this was a really smart choice for Apple. It was pretty common for proprietary ports on devices like this at the time, and so for Apple to use the same port that they were already using with their massively popular iPods was actually a really convenient and consumer-friendly move. Even if you didn't already have one, of course the phone came with one, but beyond just that, stores would have these already. Third parties made these. They were just in wide abundance already. It also allowed for the same docking station functionality and all of that good stuff that came with it, even making for cross-compatible accessories with the majority of things made for the iPod. The speaker's pretty good. At least it was for the time. Maybe not by modern standards, but that's unsurprising. you do of course have the ear speaker grill above the display for when you make calls. The microphone seems to get the job done and you can do voice memos if you want. That is an app and uh, just as an example of what it sounds like. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech. Hey, how's it going? I'm Josh from 91 Tech. Yeah, okay, it's not great. It sounds like a phone mic, <laughs> which I mean it is one. So it makes more sense when you think about the fact that this phone doesn't take a video. So the microphone didn't need to be the most robust. It gets the job done. Another cool thing, this phone already introduced a proximity sensor. You know how when you make a call and hold your phone up to your ear, the display just knows to turn itself off to save battery life, and then when you lower the phone, it turns back on? Yeah, the first iPhone already did that, so chalk up yet another innovation that stuck around. In a similar vein, the iPhone can also adjust screen brightness based on ambient light, so if you go outside, the screen should get brighter, versus if you use your iPhone under the covers in bed, the screen will get dimmer, assuming you have auto brightness turned on in settings. There's also the accelerometer, which allows for the iPhone to automatically rotate the screen, switching the orientation between between portrait and landscape dependent on how you're holding it. Just add yet another innovation to the counter. Uh, I should also mention the vibration motor which has the phone sounding like a bus crashing into your house whenever it goes off. Remember this sound? <laughs> Nowadays we have the Taptic Engine, an iPhone, which is fantastic, quiet, subtle, and far superior in every way. But yeah, if my phone doesn't rattle my bones when it vibrates, then it's not doing a very good job. Steve Jobs goes to Macworld and he, he pulls out this iPhone. What was your first reaction when you saw that? <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. The lack of physical keyboard was hugely controversial at the time, and a bold but brilliant move from Steve Jobs and his team. Having that single button made the phone simple and intuitive, along with just using your finger to touch and do everything. Steve Jobs talks about in the presentation different ways of interacting with these devices. He goes over some former Apple innovations, the mouse, the scroll wheel, and now just your finger. We're going to use the best pointing device in the world. We're going to use a pointing device that we're all born with. We're born with 10 of them. We're going to use our fingers. And we have invented a new technology called multi-touch, which is phenomenal. It works like magic. The multi-touch functionality mixed with the software being so straightforward in that familiar grid layout that really hasn't changed. Just look at what smartphones looked like before iPhone when it comes to both the design and the user interfaces, and I think you'll see what I'm getting at. Not only do those user interfaces on those tiny screens look closer to Windows 95 than anything else, but they were often both hard to navigate and difficult to just really figure out. While the busy businessman might really like his Blackberry to quickly pound off email after email, your average Joe would have zero interest in any of that if he could even figure it out in the first place. If it's not abundantly clear, smartphones existed, but this was so many light years ahead of anything they had accomplished. And yet, even so, the first iPhone feels quite limited today, and really has for well over a decade. The big question to answer, can you even use this iPhone anymore, is basically a no, sort of. Technically speaking, I mean, I'm using the iPhone right now, swiping around and whatnot. I could load some music on here. It can load some really basic web pages really darn slowly. It's got at least some semblance of usability to a point, but if we want to stick a SIM card in here, we end up hitting our first roadblock of the modern age, 2G. And, uh, well, we're on 5G these days, but even in 2007, 3G was starting to get more and more popular, and 2G was almost immediately outdated. Hence why in 2008 we would see the second iPhone, the iPhone 3G, bringing 3G networking. That's why the iPhone 2G is dubbed the iPhone 2G. Apple just called it iPhone. Then there was the 2009 3GS, with the S standing for speed, and then finally the 2010 iPhone 4. From which point onwards, Apple's naming conventions would 
totally makes sense with no weird deviations whatsoever. Totally. Anyway, the first iPhone would come out locked to AT&T and Singular, which were merging into the AT&T that we still have today. And this phone was only sold in the United States. AT&T shut down their 2G networks at the beginning of 2017. So straight out of the box, if you were to spend the ridiculous thousands of dollars to get one of these that are allegedly still sealed, you wouldn't be able to use the first iPhone with any sort of network, rendering it not really usable as a phone at least. As an iPod music player, sure, but not as an iPhone, at least not truly. All right, so that's if you just had a stock iPhone. What if you had an unlocked iPhone, which isn't actually too difficult to do? The jailbreaking scene has done a number on these original iPhones, but we'll get to that later. In any case, the US has only a single carrier still running a 2G network, and that's T-Mobile, at least at the time of making this a video. How reliable that coverage is, I have zero idea, but it doesn't really matter since there's a shutdown date of April 2nd, 2024, anyhow. All right, Future Josh checking in. Turns out T-Mobile isn't shutting down their network quite yet, or at least probably are not. Their website now says that they do not have a date for a 2G network shutdown. They did say April 2nd before, but I guess they changed their minds. You gotta wonder how many people are still using 2G networks these days in the US, but in any case, it seems to be still around for maybe even a little bit longer. Personally, I'm in Canada, and it's worth noting that in different places around the world, particularly outside of the first world, 2G networks are still very much around. Theoretically, if you had an unlocked iPhone, they would work on those networks if they're GSM. In Canada, Rogers supposedly still offers 2G coverage. I'm with Telus, otherwise I might have tried it out, but even if you could technically still make a call with the first iPhone, there's still not a whole lot else you would want to do with it. The reality of the situation here is that this phone is just insanely old now, and the specs could barely hold their own at the time of this phone's final software update, iPhone OS 3.1.3 in 2010. Yes, yeah, so this phone is so old that it doesn't even run iOS, but iPhone OS, which is what Apple called iOS until iOS 4. There's a black background here, not because I intentionally chose it as a wallpaper, but because the phone is too slow to run a wallpaper. It doesn't even have an option for one aside from the lock screen, which was actually still pretty darn cool for the time. And side note, gotta love that classic slide to unlock. I could take a moment and talk about how important that slide to unlock was, especially since it mitigated so well pocket dialing, but we're already taking our time enough here, so let's just keep going. One area of the first iPhone that actually wasn't incredibly innovative was the camera, which was apparently so irrelevant, Apple didn't even show it off with one single photo example from their entire January 2007 presentation, even though they did show off the photo app. I actually recently did a video going through the entire keynote, and I'll link it in the description. It was really fascinating and so wild hearing the audience reacting to such trivial, simple things that have become such mainstays in smartphones ever since. Things like just touching and interacting with the touchscreen, the rubber banding and momentum when scrolling, or particularly when Steve Jobs pinches on a photo to zoom it in. I mean, just listen to this. I can just take my fingers and I can, we call it the pinch. I can bring them closer together or move them further apart to make it bigger or smaller. And so I can just move them further apart and stretch the image. The camera itself here is only two megapixels. I mean, just look at how small that camera is. Like, it's kind of crazy, right? It's literally smaller than the flash on the newer iPhones. Heck, the camera bump alone on the 15 Pro Max feels like half the size of this phone. And when we turn to actual photos, this is one area we can actually see the 17 year jump. The first iPhone takes blurry, grainy pictures that do really have an appealing vintage look, at least to me. But yeah, I will still take my 15 Pro Max any day of the week. There's also no selfie camera on this thing. Uh, that's notable. That wouldn't come until the 2010 iPhone 4. So if you wanted to take a selfie, you had to do it the old fashioned way. You gotta do it like, like this. <laughs> oh yeah, and the volume to, the volume buttons don't work to take pictures either. I was trying to do that. I forgot about that. So it has to face you and you have to manage to hit the camera button. So uh, yeah, not ideal. The first iPhone couldn't even take a video without jailbreaking, and judging by some of these photos, it's uh, pretty apparent why, along with the overall pitiful processing power. Okay, honestly, that was a little bit harsh. This camera, is it really that bad? I, I actually don't think so. Some of these photos have turned out pretty well for me. Now, it's really easy to get a blurry photo. You gotta hold the camera very still in order to get anything even remotely decent, I suppose. It's only two megapixels, it's very limited, but the way it does colors and everything, that kind of grainy look to it, I don't know, it's just, it's really appealing to me. Compared to the 15, Pro, it doesn't hold up as badly as I thought it did. The shutter speed is also really slow. You can't just spam it like you can on newer iPhones. There's also no autofocus as well, so if you tap on the screen, nothing happens. You just gotta rely on it to focus itself and hope for the best. Overall here, don't wanna be too hard on the camera. I think for the time, it was pretty average at best. There is a reason Apple didn't show it off so much, but for a 2007 smartphone, definitely could be worse.
Let's actually take a look at the specs and compare it to what we have today. In the iPhone 15 Pro, you've got Apple's custom ARM-based processor and the A17 Pro chipset and 8 gigabytes of RAM, as opposed to the first iPhone with its Samsung ARM 11 processor clocked in at 412 megahertz along with 128 megabytes of RAM. These are just numbers, and it's really difficult to express the jump in power from these two devices, but for the sake of just adding some context, the iPhone 15 Pro scores around 2900 on Geekbench for a single core score versus around 140 from user submitted scores with the first iPhone. 2900, 140, yeah, kind of a big difference. I'd give the multi core score, but the first iPhone only has one core versus six on the 15 Pro. The iPhone 4 with its A4 chip was Apple's first custom chipset, and that's something that's only continued to improve and far surpass the competition throughout the years, with it eventually expanding to Apple's own Macs, not just their phones, M1, M2, etc. Ultimately, though, the first iPhone's processor is pretty darn weak, and it's not helped by its puny amount of RAM. I mean, 128 megabytes is laughably little compared to what we have today, and it's a miracle this thing can even run any app at all. Loading just the Google page on Google Chrome takes apparently so many gigabytes on my PC, but loading Google on the first iPhone, it's not fast, but it's doable, and with only a fraction of the amount of memory. Not really a fair comparison, but it goes to show how far we've come here. Even in laptops and things at the time, it wouldn't be uncommon to only see 512 megabytes of RAM in similar numbers. When it comes to actual storage, the first iPhone has a few variations. Originally, you had 4 and 8 gigabyte models at 500 and 600 US dollars respectively. After launching only in June, Apple would revise this September 2007, dropping the 4 gig model altogether, reducing the 8 gig model to 400 bucks, and in February 2008, they brought in a 16 gig model at $500. Early adopters were obviously and justifiably very upset by the very quick price drop, and Apple ended up giving store credit to those who got screwed over. Our goal, and we think what serves the customer best, is to constantly be working on making things better. We're we're working on the next iPhone, we're working on the one after that, we're thinking about the one after that. And that's what our customers want us to do. They want to know that when they're ready to upgrade, we're going to have something even better for them. And, uh that's what that's what the, part of what they pay us to do. It's pretty wild to see Apple actually dropping the price of the iPhone whatsoever, never mind mid-generation. Although, of course, all these models still came with the major requirement of a two-year contract with AT&T. Why did Apple drop the price? Well, the phone got easier and cheaper to produce. The technology was moving so darn quickly that Apple's former price point wasn't keeping up, so they could make it cheaper. And if I had to guess, the first iPhone, at least initially, probably wasn't selling that well because it was so expensive. Once they did this, though, it definitely helps things out. Now, accounting for inflation of the US dollar from 2007 to 2024, that original 499 for the 4 gig model now equates to around and over 730 bucks, a not quite 50% of rise. There's a number of takeaways here, like how it's absolutely terrifying that money is now 47% less valuable than it was 17 years ago. But what really blew me away is that back when I did a video on this in 2019, which was only five years ago, that 499 was worth about $617 at 23% inflation. So 500 bucks from 2007 is the same as $617 in 2019 is the same as $730 in 2024. You have the same rate of inflation, but it's happened in five years instead of 12. All right, let's pretend we didn't talk about that and just move on. $730-ish dollars is still quite a bit of money, but it's not far at all from what iPhones cost today. In fact, it's a little less. The iPhone 15 starts at 800 bucks and the 15 Pro 1000, at least in the US. So it's kind of interesting to see how smartphone prices have changed over the years, especially because it was still extremely expensive in 2007. That's why the 2008 iPhone 3G would make significant price cuts and move to plastic, not really bringing any proper technical upgrades aside from 3G networking. It literally used the exact same processor as the first iPhone, but it only started at 200 bucks, which was more reasonable and a big part of the reason iPhones so quickly picked up steam moving into the 2010s. If you had bought one of those original iPhones at launch in 07, kept it sealed and never sold it until today, you'd make a pretty darn good return. In July 20. 23, one sold at auction for over $190,000, which is a tad bit insane. Not all of them, or even most of them, will go for that much, mind you. And I'd never personally dare to buy anything like that, given how so many sellers definitely can and will try to scam you, but it is a pretty cool collector's piece for the lucky few who have one, at the very least. It's also worth noting that the original iPhone came with quite a few more accessories than it does today. Of course, nowadays, we don't even get a charging brick in the box, which is still ridiculous, but the original iPhone not only came with 
with that charging brick and charger, but even a 30 pin dock. There was also of course ear pods, which were very important because your other headphones may not fit that headphone jack. The most interesting accessory in my opinion that Apple did sell separately was this. It might look like a single AirPod and that's sort of what it is. It's a Bluetooth device. Uh, you know, it's one of those things you stick in your ear like a busy businessman might and talk on your phone without actually holding it up to your ear. There's only one of these in the package, but still kind of a neat precursor to AirPods. It's amazing what fits in a pocket these days. Your favorite music. All your email. Today's newspaper. Endless entertainment. And of course, a phone. Realistically, if you want an average condition iPhone 2G similar to the ones I have, they seem to range from around and over 100 bucks to way too much more than that. Also, don't be fooled by these so-called vintage OS 1.0 models that supposedly have never been updated. It is possible that's the case, but it's extremely unlikely and it's not that difficult to just downgrade one of these phones yourself. Sellers will downgrade the phones and then sell them at a marked up price for being so-called collectibles when in reality, they're nothing special. Going through some of these listings, I was seeing that a seller was purposely pointing out that that the modem version was still the original, which according to them means this phone wasn't simply downgraded to 1.0 because the modem version was never updated. However, you can downgrade the modem version. That is doable. It, it can happen. So even if it does to show the correct numbers, maybe that makes it more likely to be authentic, but I'd be pretty suspicious regardless. These things have been cracked to oblivion at this point. You can pretty much do anything on them. Not saying that any of these sellers saying that they're on 1.0 are necessarily lying, but would I give them my money? No. And speaking of which, maybe it's a good time to mention the jailbreaking community and what they've done with the first iPhone. Unfortunately, there's been few new tweaks and cracks in the past decade. The vast majority of existing jailbreaks and things kind of came to be within the early years of iPhone, which makes sense because that's when people actually still owned them. Still, there's some notable things you can do with these. We've already mentioned unlocking the carrier, downgrading the OS, video recording, and beyond all that, there's a lot of customization and freedom to do basically whatever you want. Heck, people have run Android on these things. It is very open-ended. I remember when I was younger, the tweak I was impressed by was White Door 7, which aims to basically give give these early iOS devices a primitive version of iOS 7, including even a control center. I can't imagine this runs well whatsoever, but honestly, there's so much to talk about with jailbreaking these old things, I think it'd be worth its own video. If you guys are interested, let me know by hitting the like button, that's much appreciated. There is a lot more we could go into, but I think we've gotten at least a pretty good glimpse into the world of the first iPhone, and what it can do today, sort of. I haven't shown many apps, you may have noticed. Of course, the App Store does not work, and even if it did, it would be nigh on impossible to find apps actually still compatible. I don't know if there are any. If there are, it's probably mainly abandoned wear. Now the best shot to actually have apps on this thing that you can play and use is if you still have one from back in the day and just never reset it. Unfortunately, that isn't the case for me. So basically, if you really want apps on this thing, you're stuck with side loading, jailbreaking, hoping there are downloads for you online. And of course, there you're getting into some questionably legal stuff. So we'll just go ahead and leave it at that. We can connect this phone to iTunes. In fact, uh, iTunes still shows the correct phone and everything. Thing. You could download music this way and use the phone as an iPod if you really wanted to for some reason. And we can also restore, backup, even update this phone to its latest version, iPhone OS 3.1.3, which runs really darn poorly. Yeah, iPhone OS 3 is dang slow, but in the very least, usable. So let's take a look at the software. What apps do we have? Well, after counting them briefly, it seems about 20. So this is stock with iPhone OS 3, like it had just been reset. Messages, calendar, photos, camera, YouTube, stocks, maps, weather, voice memos, notes, clock, calculator settings, iTunes, app store, phone, mail, Safari, iPod, and then on the next page, all by its lonesome contacts. I think there's something ironic about putting contacts by itself, maybe? Uh, anyway, that messages app originally had a different icon. It had SMS on it. And the answer is no, iMessage isn't on the first iPhone. You can't text people over Wi-Fi like you can with your Apple ID on newer devices. You need a cellular connection, unfortunately. The calendar is pretty straightforward and honestly, not a lot different from the current calendar. I mean, it is just a calendar. How much can you change, I guess? There's of course the Photos app, which is very functional. And in a certain sense, I would say it's more functional than it is today. Like the Photos app at this point is so darn complicated. There's the Camera app, of course, which takes photos. Not good photos, but photos. And it does have that little icon so you can go see your most recent picture, which is just intelligent design, honestly. You've also got the cool shutter animation every time you open or close the camera app or take a photo and that classic iconic sound. 
Then you have the YouTube app. Uh, this doesn't work and it hasn't worked for a long time. Unfortunately, YouTube also doesn't work on Safari. Google actually originally had a deal with Apple, which we'll see in a moment here as you have the Maps app, which is Google Maps. That's right. This phone used Google Maps and that was actually a big selling point. I'm not gonna take too much time on these. There might be a way to get the YouTube app working with some jailbreak stuff. The Google Maps app, it seems to work fine. It is just Google Maps after all, and it was really cool for the time. There's voice memos, which is pretty self-explanatory. I do love the design of this app. Some developer had some fun when they were putting this together. You've got a, like a classic microphone with your audio level at the bottom there, a shiny record button, the menu button. I love it. Just in general, the kind of old skeuomorphism of these phones, I, I really like. It made so much sense for the time. It was actually one of the things I think that made iPhone originally so successful, even with people who normally wouldn't adopt new tech. With skeuomorphism, everything kind of looks like a real object. That's what it's going for. Your camera is a realistic looking camera. Voice memo is a microphone. Your notes app looks like a notebook. These are just little things that not only add to the design and overall experience, but also just help people intuitively figure things out. They see something that they inherently recognize and it looks cool. Anyways, uh, the voice memos app, then the notes app, which as already shown, looks like a notebook. I love this. It's so cool. Honestly, not a lot different again from the notes app today. That digital keyboard, by the way, looks pretty darn similar to what we have today. Honestly, this thing is small and kind of hard to type with because I'm so used to my bigger phone, but the other Autocorrect seems to work pretty well. It'll add punctuation and correct very minor misspellings. Autocorrect is one thing that really hasn't gotten much better over the years. I mean, it sort of has. AI is already making it a lot better than it's ever been, but still, that's right, autocorrect here. Add that to the abundance of things that would become a mainstay on smartphones. But it makes sense because you didn't have a physical keyboard, meaning it's harder to use just inherently. So autocorrect kind of at least helped alleviate that and eventually became an extreme annoyance for people. But overall, uh, I think it does the job. And this digital keyboard, in general, brilliant idea. I don't know how many times I've said the word revolutionary or innovative in this video. I, I'm just gonna assume you get the point. Back to the apps though. You've got the clock app. This is almost identical to what we have today. Like nothing's changed. Like yeah, the design's changed, sure, but you've got a timer, stopwatch, alarm, and world clock. On the modern clock app, you have a timer, stopwatch, alarms, world clock. The only real difference is the uh, plurality of timers and alarms. So I guess you can start multiple timers now. I actually didn't know you could do that. Interesting. Well, you can still set multiple alarms at least on the old iPhone. So you would be like me and have like a trillion alarms from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. for when you need to uh, get up. The stopwatch though is identical, even has the lap feature. The world clock is the world clock. I mean, how wild is it that this UI hasn't really changed? All right, calculator app. This is a calculator. Yeah, I mean, th there's not a lot to it, right? Although if you go to the widescreen orientation, that's when you have a lot more options. There's the settings app, mind boggling, I know. What gets me is just how few options there are relative to today. Like I barely have to scroll and I'm at the bottom of the settings app already. But you've got airplane mode, Wi-Fi, sounds, brightness, wallpaper, general, mail, phone, safari, messages, iPod, photos, store, and uh, that's about it. Of course, most of these have subsections of some sort. General is the big one. If you go to about, you know, I've got all your information. There's auto lock. You can add a passcode. Restrictions. That's right. They already had some parental restriction stuff on here. International. It's actually worth noting. Most phones back in the day wouldn't have very many language options if multiple in the first place. This has a lot. So that's pretty cool, especially since it was only sold in the US. You've got phone. Phone, mail, Safari, iPod. It's kind of interesting. They have a dedicated contacts app, but then the phone also has an option for contacts. Something they really pushed in the presentation was kind of the ease of use looking for somebody in your contacts instead of just selecting recent numbers because most phones at the time had just the worst UIs. So this was a huge improvement for sure. The mail app is simple. I can't be bothered to sign in right now, but I'm sure it would work fine. You've got Microsoft Exchange, Mobile Me, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, AOL as the default options. At least one of those are still relevant and never forget get other. You've got Safari, which is just the web browser. And notably on the top right, it's actually just got a little Google search. That's kind of cool. So you wouldn't search from the big URL bar like you would today. You would go to the top right. There's bookmarks, new tabs. You can zoom out and see all your tabs. Again, this all feels so familiar. Seriously, the first iPhone did so much new that we still use today, basically. Like, it's just wild. Getting out of that, you have the iPod app, which is just the music app. Playlists, artists, songs, videos, more. Pretty straightforward, easy to use, and was a big selling point of this phone because iPods were so big. And while on flip phones or other phones, you could put music on there. To have integration with iTunes was so important because iTunes was the way of the future at the time for music downloading. And now, of course, we basically stream everything. But again, this iPod app does still work. You can get songs through iTunes on the computer. And that's the first iPhone. There's no notification center. If you drag down from the top, nothing happens. There's no control center dragging from the bottom. There's really not a lot to this iPhone. And yet that was so important for the time. It had to be simple, but it 
had to be functional, work, and be cool and unique and important enough for people to want it. And not just want it, but eventually need it. And that's exactly what would happen. There's just so much to love about the first iPhone. And I would never want to have to use one 17 years later. Is it technically usable? Sort of, yes. You're probably gonna struggle with 2G networks, but aside from that, yeah, I mean, you could totally use this as an iPod. And the battery life, I don't think I've talked about that. The battery in here is small, but actually pretty good in my experience. I'd imagine if you're really using the phone, especially watching something or being on phone calls or stuff like that, you probably would drain the battery pretty quickly. But I can leave these phones just idle on standby in between filming. They'll just last for many days. It's crazy that they still do that. Like I've never replaced these batteries. I've never opened up these phones and yet they still function just fine. This phone wasn't what I would say is built to last, but the blueprint was absolutely built to last. The blueprint is again what every smartphone uses today. How it's possible that Steve Jobs and his team came up with this many innovations that have stuck around, I do not know. Can't even describe just how inspired you would have to be to come up with every single little microcosm of what makes a smartphone a smartphone. But they did it. That we are becoming controlled by the computers. Any danger of that happening? Well, as you know, the product we manufacture, many people see it for the first time and they don't think it's a computer. It's about 12 pounds. You can throw it out the window if the relationship isn't going so well. And I think if you look at sort of the process of uh, the technological revolution that we're all in, it's a process of taking very centralized things and making them very democratic, if you will, very individualized. So right now we're at the mechanical part of intelligence, where one of these devices can free a person from many of the drudgeries of life and allow really humans to do what they do best, which is to work on the conceptual level, to work on the creative level. Apple, since Steve Jobs, is not the same company. Innovation is something we just don't see a whole lot anymore. We see a lot of, uh, you know, selling us stuff. I mean, Apple's brought out new products since Steve Jobs, but it's been rare. The Apple Watch, AirPods, how much of these innovations were unique in any way? A lot of this stuff was just natural progression, too. It was kind of what you would expect Apple to do with or without Steve Jobs. And that's the thing about old Apple, and in particular when it was under Steve Jobs, is that you never knew what they were going to do. They were Apple Computer until 2000. At the presentation where they announced the first iPhone, they changed their name from Apple Computer to Apple officially, and I'm surprised it took them so long. They were basically solely a computer company up until 2001 with the first iPod, and after that it took off, but not right away. It was an exponential curve. It started to pick up steam, and then year over year they sold more and more. And then it was around 04, iPhone development really started to begin at a time where iPod was successful, but still not even close to peaking. And pretty much anybody would look at how much it's selling and how it keeps selling more and more, and they'd say, hey, let's keep doing this and just make it better, because there was still a lot you could do with iPod to make it better. But not Steve Jobs. He looked at it and said, huh, I'm gonna replace this all together and make one of, if not the boldest products ever, period, in history. iPhone came out of nowhere. I'm John Blackstone here at Mac World. The big attraction here right now is encased in a plastic tube back there. It's Apple's combination iPod, cell phone, and internet device. It's a sleek aluminum and stainless steel creation. A cell phone doesn't have any buttons, just a touch screen. Just the way the iPod changed the way we think of music. Apple's phone may change the way we think of cell phones. Smartphone manufacturers, if you can even call those things smartphones, they were caught with their pants down. This turned Nokia from one of the biggest companies in the world to whatever the heck they even are today. Companies like Blackberry, Palm, it was the companies that didn't hesitate to copy Apple that would end up sticking around and succeeding in this new generation. Samsung is a perfect example. Look at their phones before and after iPhone. I mean, they've had so many lawsuits over this over the years. Like, yeah, they clearly copied iPhone. Everyone did. But can you blame them? Competition is good for the industry, so even for the most staunch of Apple supporters, hopefully they recognize that Android is important to push iPhone forward, and vice versa. Companies steal features from each other all the time, and ultimately it makes the end product better. But that first iPhone? It didn't steal from anyone. I mean, some features, I guess, had been around, but it was its own thing, and it was so new, nobody had even thought this thing up. But Steve Jobs did what he did so many times. He made a product that we all subsequently absolutely needed. Smartphones are integral parts of modern society. That was Apple under Steve Jobs. Today, to kind of bring the theme back to what we were talking about way at the beginning with the Apple Vision Pro headset, would Steve Jobs have done this? Would he have done it five years ago? Or would he have gone a completely different direction? You know, I didn't sleep a wink last night. <laughs> and uh, I was so excited about today because we've been so lucky at Apple. We've had some real revolutionary products. The Mac in 1984, is an experience that those of us that were there will never forget. And I don't think the world will forget it either. The iPod, 
in 2001 changed everything about music. And we're going to do it again with the iPhone in 2007. And we're very excited about this. You know, there's an old Wayne Gretzky quote that I love. I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And we've always tried to do that at Apple since the very, very beginning. And we always will. So thank you very, very much. Under Steve Jobs, Apple did stuff that nobody had even hardly imagined. Headsets, AR, VR, this stuff is cool, but it's kind of a natural progression of where we all think tech is going, right? I mean, it's been in sci-fi forever. Whether or not the Vision Pro takes the world by storm is up in the air. But what we do know is Apple never would have done any of this if iPhone had never existed. This phone is responsible for so much, and yet it's such a humble little package. And yeah, that's iPhone 17 years later. As the hardware age great, no. Has the core concept of it, the software even, everything surrounding it, the framework, the foundation, has that aged well? I think it's fair to say uh, yes. The iPhone might not be the first smartphone, but it might as well be. People are interacting more and more with intelligent devices, whether it be an intelligent game or an intelligent bank teller or whatever. And uh, we, you're, you're already seeing it in society now. People are becoming more and more familiar with interacting with intelligent electronic devices and uh, that's changing things culturally. It's a step along the way. I love the first iPhone, and while it doesn't hold up 12 years later, I mean, who thought it ever would? And you really can't deny the significance this phone has in history. And so with that, I think we're right about done here. Honestly, uh, I could probably talk more about this phone. I, I mean, I definitely could. There's just, it's just so cool, right? And that, that's what really it comes down to. There's no reason to have one of these besides collector purposes. There's no reason to even really want one, but I don't know, there's something about it. It just, it's a piece of history and it's just mind boggling how much this phone really set a precedent of. So yeah, anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, maybe hit that like button and uh, even consider subscribing for more content just like this. You can follow me on my socials that I don't use if you'd like to. We do have a Discord that I sometimes use and thanks to all the channel members, you guys are the absolute best. So uh, without further ado, thank you so much for watching. I am Josh from 91 Tech and I will see you all next time.